Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Finsbury Food Group PLC Preliminary Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted anytime via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. Have the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via Investor Meet Company dashboard and we'll notify you once they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. And now I'd like to hand you over to John Duffy, CEO, and Steve Boyd, CFO of Finsbury Food Group PLC. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm John, um, and this is Steve um, alongside me. So we're going to take you through a bit of a, a sort of double act. So I will do a bit of an introduction, overview, and the markets and the business. Steve will take you through a fairly detailed description of the financial results, and then I'll pick up at the end, talk a little bit about strategy and outlook. So without further ado then, um, I'll just start with a very um, simple overview uh, description of the business for those that are not as familiar with Finsbury Foods yet. So we're one of the largest specialty bakery groups in the UK, and we do have some obviously operations as well. We're diversified by product category, by channel, and also by geography. We operate in pretty large markets, so bread market in the UK would be 5 billion of sales. Uh, we operate across a, a very broad range of customers and channels, so food service, ambient retail, etc. And we've got pretty diversified manufacturing facilities in both the UK and in Europe now in Poland. And we tend to make different products in each of the factories rather than all the products in individual factories. And we've got a strong and evolving brand portfolio with people like Mars, and Ferrero, etc. We tend to be, as a speciality bakery group, number one in a, in a, in a kind of range of profitable niches such as celebration cakes, branded organic breads, and premium round cakes, particularly with some of the premium ranges in the likes of Tesco, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, etc. So moving on to the year that um, we're covering today, it's been a very resilient year, I guess, uh, despite everything that's been happening. It has been an uncertain environment, as you all know. Uh, with a couple of quite big changes in terms of COVID and also Brexit to talk about. The year itself, um, the first half was pretty tricky. It was still an awful lot of COVID impacts um, on the business. The second half was very strong. So whereas in the first half, we declined by just over 4%. In the second half, we grew by over 9% versus the prior year. And that strong performance in the year was driven by retail, which was up just under six percentage points of sales. And food service was down across the year by 15%. Although, of course, with food service being unlocked as the year progressed in the UK and in Europe, uh, we actually saw our food service sales grow in the second half by just under five percentage points. So getting back to some sort of normality. And our overseas division, which was particularly France and Benelux, etc., grew by over 13, 13.5% in the year, uh, with a strong performance pretty much across the board, but particularly driven by our celebration cake business in Europe. So as well as the growth, I guess the highlights are that we continue to be able to focus on our strategic priorities and more of those later on. And some of the improvements that we drove through those activities resulted in a higher gross margin in the year, uh, which Steve will come back to later. I guess overall, we would pick out the fact that we were a very uh, strong uh, crisis management business. Uh, we're good uh, when there's plenty of challenges, We've got strong experience and strong teams. And we adapted very well to the challenges of producing complex products throughout COVID, despite having to have the safety of our people first and foremost, and our supply chains increasingly under challenge. We focused on our people, our customers, and our cash throughout the, uh, the last year or so. And in recognition of that, I guess, in May, we were able to announce that things were going a bit better than we had feared um, in the second half. And we announced that we would pay a dividend for the year of 2.4p, which is likely to be paid in December after our AGM in November. So we're a very resilient group, which we'll hope to show you today. We've got a very strong balance sheet, which Steve will bring back, come back to later on. And I think we're increasingly very well positioned for growth. Other kind of strategic highlights in the period just covered that I might pick out 
we've covered a gross margin already, um, but we've also installed a new uh, frozen dough ball facility in our Manchester uh, factory, which will be for food service, predominantly delivered to home pizza and also pizza restaurants, which are now back up and running um, and rather a popular cuisine. We've also been doing a lot of innovation. I'll show you some pictures um, later. Uh, and we've tended to innovate behind a lot of what we see as the strong consumer trends of recent years in bakery. So things like free from and vegan cakes, and things like vegan donuts and artisan gluten-free breads. And of course, our continued growth in our artisan sourdough breads, where we added some extra capacity a year or so ago and already finding that it's almost full. We continue to win awards. So the Q Awards are very important for our customers and our reputation. And we've put a huge amount of effort in the last couple of years into the continued development, engagement and health and well-being of our employees, including over 50 trained uh, people to help with mental health awareness within the, within the company. So a lot going on. So moving firstly then um, into the year that's been and looking a little bit more in detail at our markets. Uh, those markets, as I say, affected primarily by COVID-19 throughout the year. And then the second half, the practicalities of trading and operating in a post-Brexit world. So in terms of the big picture uh, for that year, retail continued to perform very well, so grocery retail, both in the UK and also in Europe, as you can see from our own overseas results. We were able to service our customers in Europe and indeed in Ireland, largely without disruption, despite the challenges faced post-Brexit. Food services continue to recover a little bit slower than we would have hoped given the restrictions that were required for COVID uh, case rates throughout the UK and the ongoing restrictions, but back to normal pretty much um, by the end of the year. Online as a, as a kind of, you know, both in grocery and also delivered um, out of home food to home are both in very strong growth. And that seems unlikely to revert in the near future. So we think online grocery will remain at nearly twice the size that it was pre-pandemic. As I say, momentum continues to be built in terms of consumer trends, so vegan, artisan, health and wellness have all continued to build in consumers' minds. And it would be remiss not to say that, um, you know, the combination of COVID-19, the pandemic that people were very aware of in the press and during the summer, and the post-Brexit challenges have affected Finsbury um, and towards the end of the year, and early in the new year, as it has done everybody else in our sector. So nationwide issues such as HGV driver shortages and some supply chain disruptions have fallen COVID across the world have had some impact on Finsbury, but we continue to enjoy strong growth. So I'm gonna pick out a couple of slides now that just feature uh, firstly the grocery market and how that's done over the last few years, and then come on to the home market as well as the, the view across both. So in this slide, a very busy slide, but actually it's got a very simple message. So in green, that's 2019 grocery sales across the, the calendar year. And you see that it's got a lot of seasonality um, and it's our base in terms of pre-COVID. Then with the blue line, you can see that as of you know February, March um, 2020, huge volatility introduced with COVID and some of the initial panic buying. And then sustained growth versus 2019 throughout the rest of the year, um, culminating in the Christmas peak demand in December. And then the current year, which is in red, and despite the unlocking of our economy over the course of, of this year, 2021, what you can see is actually sales have held up very well in grocery, typically value growth of circa 8% versus the pre-pandemic. So grocery has been an area that people, unsurprisingly, um, have been going to um, throughout the pandemic, buying bigger shops, going less frequently, but grocery has been a winner, clearly, from, uh, from all of the change that we've gone through over the last 18 months. On the other side of that equation um, is, of course, the out-of-home market, which has been severely disadvantaged, whether that's a pub, a restaurant, or indeed home deliveries. So in this chart, which looks quite complicated, but in practice, the messages are relatively straightforward, is in yellow is that um, take home market, which is largely the grocery channel. 
And we can see here that from February 21 right through to May and June recently, that it was enjoying strong growth current week versus the same week one year ago. And if you look at an annualized picture over that first 12 months of COVID, actually the grocery channel grew by some 12 billion pounds. So equivalent to that growth of around eight to 10% that I talked about a minute ago. And the opposite to that, again, pictorially represented during that year of COVID, is a decline in the out of home market of 21 billion pounds. Much greater, obviously, because the average spend on an item out of home is greater than that in grocery to be consumed in home. What we can see also from this chart is that towards recent um, sort of summer, with the restrictions being pretty much um, relaxed in full, that the out of home market started to move back into growth in terms of that week versus the same week in the previous year. So beginning to adjust and beginning to come back to some sort of normality. This slide, which just tries to pick up on some of the consumer trends to give you an insight as to what we've been seeing and what we are responding to. Um, on the top line, you've got some, some, some sort of key messages, I guess, so more eating at home occasions. And that might be people working from home and having their lunch and breakfast at home rather than on their way or at work. Clearly different households have experienced different transitions over the last 18 months. Uh, depending where you've got kids, depending on whether you still had to go to work or were able to work at home, or depending on whether you had other relatives or, or dependents. So lots of differences were affecting individual consumers. And the last one I pick out there is just the rise and subsequent fall, it must be said, of scratch cooking. So uh, an awful lot of consumers, when they had time on their hands and were at home anyway, um, did enjoy getting back to scratch cooking and baking, uh, but that has tended to reduce again as people and now enjoying more freedom. On the bottom, on the bottom rather of that slide, I'm picking out a few of the key themes uh, within our sector. So on the left hand side, um, the delivery phenomenon, We're not the only one, clearly lots of other delivered routes, but ordering fast food or indeed complicated food, slow food, uh, to consume at home, pre-prepared, um, very much a growth sector, particularly amongst younger consumers. Also, we've seen quite a lot of a rise in treating behaviours, so small treats, um, whether that might be just a nice cake with your cup of coffee um, or something more substantial. Um, and that grew quite substantially um, during um, the last 18 months. And actually, we see it still maintaining some evidence of treating and people enjoying being back out and seeing friends. Health has been a strong theme of recent years, very much a personal view of health, it must be said, different people having different views of what is healthy in their diet. But COVID has again highlighted um, item or issues such as obesity and the impact that can have on someone's health during something like COVID. Um, and there's an increased um, you know, interest in the health um, of food. And the last one there, which is a very strong trend, particularly um, amongst the young, but across all age groups, is plant-based. More of a response to the environmental challenges across the, the planet and the belief that eating less meat would make a meaningful difference to, uh, to the planet's health in the future. Now this slide gets into a little bit more detail. So this is looking at uh, our performance over the year uh, using uh, data from the market and comparing ourselves and our performance in each of our three main markets. So starting on the left, we have a relatively sort of modest business in retail bread and morning goods. We're quite a speciality player rather than a sliced bread player. Um, the market overall grew at 5.8 percentage points over the course of the year in value, and Finsbury grew at just over 5%. We tend to under-index on a lot of the products that we're doing well for lunchtime, etc. So we're delighted with that. So it's a very resilient everyday performance from us. And a lot of the innovation that we bring bringing to market, whether that's vegan ranges or gluten-free ranges. Um, have done very well and continue to do very well. So um, well set up in that marketplace. In retail cake market, which is our largest market in, in the business, you can see that Finsbury outperformed the market. So growth of over four percentage points in value during the year in a market that was up 1%. Initially, and in the first half, we found that people weren't able to celebrate and have as many birthdays with their friends and extended family and our food-to-go ranges were impacted negatively as well. 
But as the year went on, we saw some really strong growth in our nut-free license celebration cakes. Uh, again, very, very useful for families that are sharing uh, birthday parties with, with other children and aren't aware of what their allergies may be. So being able to guarantee that. And obviously our expanded vegan and gluten-free cake ranges uh, with the likes of Mars and their very strong brand portfolio have done very well. Others are just very well, similarly. And then coming to the right, the last market that I'm going to cover, um, good sized market for us, a food service bread and morning goods are so typically frozen. Um, as I said at the beginning, food service for us over the year down just under 14 percentage points in, on market basis. Um, not sure what the market is because it's been so volatile and it's not as easy to get the data. Um, but we would typically over index versus the market performance because we tend to have quite a lot of exposure to more protected channels such as education, the public sector and the home delivery sector with customers such as KFC. So a pretty um, slow start in the first half with lots of restrictions, um, but opening up in the second half and overall seeing growth in the second half and bringing us back to about a decline of about 14 percentage points. In terms of the, some pictures, because it always helps to, uh, to bring um, some of these words to life by looking at the actual products that we're talking about, I just picked a few here. You can see on the top some of our very strong uh, Disney franchise like Spider-Man and Marvel, Pokemon, are both nut free, you can see. Um, also a Minions cake down in the bottom there, um, out of its box. And then some of the other um, innovation we've had. So our Bosch vegan cake range there in the middle in yellow. Our artisan breads on the bottom, our vegan, vegan burger bun on the top, our vegan donuts in the middle on the right. And then a new license that we launched um, in the course of the year, uh, which is TGI Fridays, which is a dessert type cake, uh, which is actually had a very strong rate of sale and it's likely to now roll out across a number of customers. So that's me covered the markets. I'm just going to briefly give you a little bit of a, a feel for the diversification of the group and then I'll pass on to Steve. So this chart again, um, you know, looks a little bit complex. Um, I'll walk you through its relatively simple messages. So on the left hand side, that is our group sales over the 12 month period. You can see that half of the business is in cake. Um, the, the remainder uh, bread is about 37%. And the overseas we've picked out there. So you can see that about 13% of our sales were overseas during the course of the financial year. Moving to the middle pie chart, uh, which is UK bakery. So simply excluding the overseas piece. Um, and what you can see there is that again, uh, just over half the group um, is cake and uh, the remainder is bread. And about 83% of our sales is in retail. Um, and about 16% of our sales is in food service. Now pre-pandemic, we would have been about 22% of our UK bakery sales in food service. So we would expect that to balance back now that um, all of the restrictions have largely been lifted, assuming there are no further restrictions imposed as we go forward. And then probably the most important part um, of this chart, a question I'm often asked, is you know, how many customers do we have and do we do business with most people? And I think you can see from the right hand side there that we do actually do business with pretty much um, all of the major retailers, um, most of the, um, the food service players such as Breaks and Bid Foods. And we also have a number of end user customers um, that we have in there as well. We over trade with a few customers such as Waitrose and the Co-op. We under trade with one or two as well. And that's really just a historical mix of the businesses that we bought and developed um, over the course of the years. So now I'm going to pass you on to Steve, who's going to take you through the financial um, results, and then I'll pick you up again once he's finished. Thank you. Thanks, John. Financial, would you go through the financial summary of the group for, for the year? Keep in mind, as uh, before we start, that this year was a full year, 12 months of trading in a pandemic environment compared to three months in the, in the previous year. And also, as John noted earlier on, we have a six month post Brexit trading period. So the full year revenue results are 2.3 percent up or seven million pounds to 313.3 million pounds now we're, we're, it was a definitely a business a case of two halves in the first half of the year we saw that our trading was 4.1 percent lower than it was the previous year and and in the second half it was 9.1 percent higher 
So we saw strong recovery throughout the year uh, as we got used to the trading environment and as the environment it generally started to improve. The gross margins of the business have improved and you can see that they've gone up by 1.1% uh, adjusted for uh, uh, to make them consistent. So their consistent basis, they've gone up from 31.8% to 32.9%. And we described Finsbury as a well-invested group. About five, five years ago, we invested quite heavily in computer systems and have a cross-group uh, ERP system, which means we're all doing the same thing in every business. And that gives, uh, gives us the ability to manage cross-group initiatives effectively. And one of those is called the Operating Brilliance Program, which is a, a program to make sure that we make high-quality products, we make them efficiently, and we make them every day. And that program is, is multifaceted. It looks at labor and make sure is it properly trained, but it also looks at the materials that we acquire and make sure they fit within a very tight spec to make sure that they're properly uh, machinable in the factories. It, it looks at the, the, the machines themselves to make sure that they're working at the correct standards and are properly maintained. Altogether, it adds up to a program that actually ensures consistent uh, manufacturing and is driving forward gross margins. And that is underpinning the 1.1% growth in gross margin during the course of the year. The operating profit line uh, grew by 7.8% from 14.9 to 16.1 million. So that's a growth of 1.2 million pounds. And that will be driven by both the increase in sales, but also by the improvement in gross margin, 16.1 million pound, which reflects an operating margin of 5.1%, a growth of 0.2% from the previous year, uh, uh, where it was 4.9%. So all of the all the metrics are positive as we come through uh, th this year and into the new year. EBITDA, which in, in our business is an important measure, it's, a, it's effectively the cash generation of the business, that grew from 26.2 to 26.9 million, so a growth of 2.5%. Uh, the, 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 the growth is slightly lower than that of the operating profit, and that is uh, because of more assets being fully depreciated as we bought a business a few years ago, five years ago, and it was out of administration, so we decided to depreciate its assets over a five-year period, and now that's come through, and that's the dynamic driving that relative increase. But all in all, we're, we're very happy with the EBITDA growth, and it does reflect, all of these reflect themselves in profit before tax growth of 10.2%. So there's two di dri drivers di driving that growth from 13.7 uh, to 15.1. One is obviously the growth in sales and the growth in margin that we've talked about. But two, and as we'll come on to in a few minutes' time, the group's level of debt is has plummeted, and therefore the interest costs element, uh, which is included within profit before tax, is ever diminished. This follows into earnings per share, as you would expect, with growth in profit before tax as well as profit after tax. The growth in earnings per share has gone up by 11.7% from 7.7p to 8.6p, and driven by the growth and profit of the business. And then finally, the bank debt. We found that we went at the start of the coronavirus, we, we, very looked we looked very closely at how we managed the business and made sure that we, we optimized the cash generation of the business. This has reaped countless rewards, as you can see, a 13.4 million reduction in bank debt. And at 13.1 million, that is a very low gearing for, for a company uh, as ourselves and leaves us in a very with a very healthy balance sheet. The, the if you look at the accounts, you'll see that we broadly we have two sectors. We have the UK bakery and you have the overseas uh, sector. The UK bakery represents eighty seven percent of the group in revenue terms, and the overseas sector thirteen percent. Uh, this, this, uh, as we'll, we'll get on to the overseas sector, but that is a very, very much growing, as you'll see from the figures. Previously, it was uh, eleven percent, so it, it, as a proportion of the group, it is growing quite notably. But focusing in on the UK bakery business first, the growth in revenue of zero point eight percent, or two point three million pounds, from two hundred seventy one point four to two hundred seventy three point three, is very much a case of two halves. Um, 
as we've referred to before, with the second half seeing notable growth compared to the first half, and John has already touched on those figures. But the other dynamic that we need to bear in mind is that our group comprises cake and bread and morning goods, and we have a, a, a food service element within that. 37% uh, of the bread and morning good business is actually food service. So what we did see over the course of the year, it was growth in cake, which is primarily in the retail sector, a growth of 3.2%, much higher growth in the second half than in the first half. But we also saw uh, in the case of bread and morning goods, we saw overall a uh, decline of 2.8%, but very much a growth in the second half of the year as we emerged through that. So across all metrics, whichever way we look at our business, as we came through the second half, we were significantly outperforming a year before and the first half. This all manifested itself in a growth in gross margins, so 33 to 34.5%. And the reason for that growth is exactly, as I said, on the total group uh, earlier on, the operating brilliance program, we're driving forward those gross margins and it will hopefully be very stickable and sustainable. And then in the case of operating profit, we've seen a growth there of 13.1 uh, to 13.6 or 3.4%. Uh, all for, for the above factors that we've re uh, referred to, growth in revenue and growth in the margin percentage, leaving us with an operating margin of 4.8 to 5%. In the, on the right-hand side, we have the overseas business. The overseas business grew by 4.7 million from uh, 34.9 million pounds to 39.6, so a growth of 13.4%. This overseas business is primarily France and Benelux. We have a subsidiary in France, which is um, the, the main area. What it does is it trades primarily with Finsbury products. So it, uh, it um, sells celebration cakes made in Scotland. It, it sells bike, bike style cakes made in Scotland, and it sells gluten-free bakery products made in our Polish factory. And in, in, across all those metrics, we are seeing significant growth. And uh, as these business, as these models, a celebration cake model, which is tradi traditionally not something that was seen in France, has now become a mainstream category and is getting real growth. And this growth is continuing into the new year. The gross margin percentages is a slight dip. Um, you know, the relativity of this is it is a trading business. So it buys products from our factories and sells them on. So it doesn't have a manufacturing environment. We're not, we're not fussed by that because the overall growth and operating profit from 1.8 to 2.5 million pounds is a 40% growth, which is, is, is sizable in the context of this, this, this business. And then finally, the operating margin from 5.1 to 6.3% shows how if you grow revenues, you leverage your overhead and you get a good performance on the back of it. Moving on to the next slide, and this is an important slide, I think if there's one message I want to leave you with is that Finsbury and food in general, but Finsbury is a highly cash generative business. Um, as I said to you at the beginning of COVID, we really locked down to make sure that we optimized our cash and we're in no way threatened, managed indebtors and, and um, managed the general performance of the business very closely. And the rewards of that were quite notable. The, 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 the cash generating EBITDA 26.9, effectively of that 13.4 million at the bottom of that right hand corner, manifests itself in a reduction in, ca in debt. And uh, the, there are other dynamics in there that we use the 26.9 million EBITDA for. So working capital continued to improve 2.9 million as we focus very closely on making sure that, uh, that uh, it's under control. The, you, you would have expected it, in fact, to slightly decrease as a result of the uh, improvement in the, in the business half year on half year. But there are other dynamics in play, particularly with regard to the level of activity in the last months of the year, which do have a big impact on the working capital. And in this case, they actually offset the, the outflow of, uh, or the, the growth in working capital that would have, effect, would have resulted from the recovery and improvements in the trading performance. So net, we had an inflow of funds with three million pounds, which we're, we're very happy with. CapEx in the year, we spent 6.2 million pounds, which is up from 4.7 million pounds. 
Uh, CapEx is an important part of our business. I described us as well invested earlier on. As I told you, we invested quite heavily in systems and we continue to invest in the business as John I, I identified at the beginning where we put new capacity in those niches where we know we're strong. So Don, John referred to the, the artisan breads and we've invested in doubling the uh, increasing the capacity there by 50 percent and we put in increased capacity also in dough balls to spot a trend whereby the pizza business is growing significantly and those lines are already full um lease payments is primarily uh the, the reflecting the rentals on those factories that we rent um it's gone down because of a reduction in the number of sites that we rent we own primarily most of our big sites and that's an important point to note from a perspective of interest, interest would go down as, as the debt has plummeted. So you would expect to see interest reduced from 1.1 million to 0.7 million. And tax, there's a, there's a few quirks in there. The growth in tax paid in the period would reflect higher profits to start with. But also the last year's figures, we, we do recover research and development from grants that the government gives. We do it every second year and we did it last year and not this year. And that alone was worth 1.1 million pounds. So all understandable, we pay our taxes in accordance with the normal country rates uh, and no, no fancy tax games are, play, are played. From a point of view of free cash flow generating 16.4 million, what we did do during the lockdown period of COVID-19 COVID and the uncertainty is we stopped uh, paying, we stopped a dividend for a year. We're now delighted to say that we're reinstating that and, and have declared a dividend of 2.4p, which will be payable to shareholders on the register in November and paid in December. And that, that will be uh, a payment of 3 million going forward. But in the year that we've just gone by, there was no cash outflow as a result of the dividend. But what we did do as well is when the share price went down to below 60p, we, we did actually go into the market and buy our own shares we bought two million pounds worth of shares and put them in our in EBT, which will meet ongoing commitments for the medium term. Uh, payment to non-controlling interest. We do have a minority share in, in, a, in a subsidiary in France, and that is the dividend element relating to that, um, which overall results in a decrease in debt before uh, other non uh, out of the normal events uh, of 14.2 million pounds. So quite high, uh, quite a lot of cash generated in the period. And the acquisition element is deferred acquisition on a company we bought in 2018. And there's some closure costs of a factory that have now that, that is now gone of 0.3 million overall, resulting in a reduction in debt of 13.4 million pounds. One final slide from me, just to cover two points. So from a perspective of debt at 13.1 million pounds, you know, our debt to EBITDA, which is a measure that a lot of people look at, is less than 0.5 times. So we've got a very strong balance sheet. Uh, we do have a lot of facilities available to us. If you think we've only got 13.1 million debt, but we have credit facilities of 55 million. And that reflects uh, a, a, a deal, uh, a banking deal done three or four years ago. We will be in the course of the next few months renegotiating our bank facilities. And at this level that we're at now, we won't need the level of bank facility we required four years ago when we did negotiate it. And then the final point for me is that one of our companies uh, has, has a defined benefit pension scheme in it with a deficit of 14.5 million, which you'll see on the face of the balance sheet. We are paying that deficit off over a period of about 20 years of 500,000 contribution per annum. Uh, the next actuarial valuation will be done in December 2021, where we expect to see the position to improve notably because the investment performance over the three years has been quite good. And also we expect to see some changes in the dynamics of the, no the, the, the member population as that scheme has been closed since uh, 2010 and therefore the number of participants in it uh, is ever reducing. And John, it, back across to you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Steve. So I'm going to just um, spend a few moments um, on strategy and outlook, um, and then we'll move to the Q&A. I can see we've got some questions that come through already, so thank you for those. So in terms of our strategy, we've had a very consistent strategy uh, for a number of years now. So you know, it's everything from investing, innovating, being very focused on our customers, having a balanced portfolio, 
be very much multi-channel and driving growth hard through both organic growth and acquisition. So uh, not an unusual strategy for a business like ours. Um, we want to be the leading speciality bakery group. We've made good progress on that journey and there's lots of opportunity still to go. A few years ago, as Steve mentioned, we set out some operating principles. So these are the, the six operating principles there in the wheel. Um, everything from people who care through to cost efficiencies and effectiveness and growth with our partners. And these allow us to approach um, our initiatives across the group in a consistent manner. And that's important because we have over 3,000 employees and over 300 million pounds worth of sales. And we want to make sure that we're getting proper scale benefits and best practice adopted across the group. So during the course of the year, I've picked out on the right hand side a few examples of our, what we call our strategy into action under those six operating principles. So I'll just pick out a few and give you a quick update on those. So we mentioned that we put in place a few years ago an ERP system, which allows us to manage our supply chain from uh, end to end very, very effectively. Um, we've continued to invest in that. So we've got a, a BI system, which gives all of our KPIs now automatically, not in spreadsheets, but through an automated system. Uh, we're investing at the moment in some new supply chain optimization and software, which will, again, give the teams great opportunities to consolidate our demand planning um, using you know, really good, clever algorithms and everything across the entire group with one tool. We're also investing in product lifecycle management because we do a lot of innovation and being able to do that efficiently, i.e. the back of pack automatically populated and the technical standards and sourcing also automatically uh, calculated and communicated to our customers. Moving on then, the Operating Brilliance program, it has delivered significant benefits already. Um, we work with a third party that's a real specialist in this area and works with some of the largest food manufacturing companies and others across the world. So we've seen Gross margins improve largely through efficiency and waste reductions um, in the short term. We have 55 of our own people trained as leaders and practitioners and the skills that go with that. And we have another 100 or so trained in skills on the factory shop floor in all things like problem solving, et cetera. And the first of, of those people have now graduated. So they've taken the projects that they've done within Finsbury that have delivered benefits for Finsbury. They've brought them up and they've had them um, you know, certified by the university and that gives them something um, in return for, for all their hard work. In terms of some of the growth areas, um, the artisan sourdough market has been a real opportunity for us over the last few years. We've installed capacity, we filled it, we've installed some more recently, and we're pretty much at full again. So we'll be looking to add some more capacity in the short term. Similarly, our new frozen dough ball line is installed and commissioned. Um, we've already got a good um, amount of sales on there, and we anticipate picking up some new sales now that the economy is uh, back to some sort of normality. Sustainability is a big part of what we do. So as well as you know, focusing on energy use, water reduction use, and we've got a 100% zero waste to landfill. And we use 100% um, you know, green electricity currently as well. Talked earlier about our nut-free capabilities. So being able to guarantee that our celebration cakes, both branded initially and now on label, are nut-free is a real advantage for us as is being able to develop vegan and gluten-free cakes at scale for our large customers in particular. And over the last couple of years, we've implemented a group supply chain function. So that we're really thinking about how do we scale and benefit from having all of our logistics, transportation, planning, etc., um, under one roof. So moving on to the next slide, um, in terms of our opportunity for growth, uh, I noticed one of the questions points to this area as well. Uh, we've got some really strong organic growth opportunities. So you can see that we're innovating and we're picking up share in, in key areas like free from licensed celebration cakes, both in the UK and abroad. And artisan breads would be great examples of that. We have over recent years managed to move from being largely a retail business, and largely a cake business into food service into food to go into the discounters. And that's the theme that we will continue to try and optimize as we go forward. And as we become better invested, we are able um, to fulfill you know, the lowest cost producer role in some of the key areas. And we will take market share as long as we remain as competitive. The other uh, sort of main dynamic for Finsbury as a group over the long term, we've been listed for nearly 20 years now We've done probably the best part of a dozen pieces of um, acquisition um, during that time. 
which has helped us um, diversify and bulk out the group both in the UK and latterly into Europe. Now we've got very low level of debt. We're very disciplined in terms of acquisition um, and your valuations. You have to see that it really adds value to us as a group and that we can deliver some additional um, incremental value of good banking support. Um, and obviously we continue to talk to and look at acquisition opportunities. We've been very focused internally over the last couple of years, I think rightly, but there may well be some better opportunities that come available. Um, maybe even distressed opportunities. We do have some history of being successful, picking up businesses that got into trouble um, and reinvigorating and growing them further. So watch this space, I guess, would be um, the, the, the answer in terms of M&A. So moving to um, the last slide then, um, from me before we kind of move to the, the questions. The group overall has had, you know, a very challenging 18 months or so in this financial year in particular with COVID and Brexit. But we've demonstrated, I think, real strength and resilience. Um, you know, we've battled through, um, we've had a difficult first half, we've got an excellent second half, and overall that's given us a good result for the year. We've still got headwinds. Um, those are things like raw material prices, particularly in soft commodities, some cost inflation around skilled labour shortages, and indeed driver shortages. Um, not necessarily unusual in our sector, and indeed Steve and I have been in food for a very long time, and there are periods of cost inflation that has to be recovered um, you know, on a regular basis every few years. And this is really no different from, from previous times, other than it's a little bit more obvious perhaps. In terms of that uh, organic growth, I think the consumer trends are probably the thing I would call out in our speciality focus. Um, you know, where there's good growth and where there's, there's difficult things to do at scale, that's where Finsbury tends to do really well. So whether it's vegan, artisan or, or indeed health and wellness. There's opportunity with some of the changing consumer um, behaviours, um, you know, pre and post COVID and working life. So more lunchtime eating occasions at home. Some, some people are able to be able to work from home, even if it's two or three days a week. And that provides opportunity for a business like Finsbury. And we're going to lay down some new capacity in certain areas where we're tight, where we can see lunchtime demand, etc., or online demand is going to get stronger. And we want to make sure we are able to support our customers in fulfilling that demand. There are also some good opportunities. Robotics is moving on at a pace. So automation and capital expenditure to remove low value added skilled jobs, particularly given what we're seeing in terms of current shortages, is a really good opportunity for us. And we will be trialing what we call cobots over the next 12 months to make sure that we are you know, doing as much as we possibly can do in terms of automation. But overall, Finsbury is very well positioned to capitalise on growth opportunities, whether that be organic or whether that be bolt-ons, given our very strong balance sheet. So that's the formal presentation um, finished. And we'll move now to the Q&A. I can see Fantastic. Uh, of questions. Fantastic. John C, thank you very much indeed for the presentations. Yes, you've had a, a great number of questions come through. And ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. But just while the team take a few moments to review those investor questions mm -hmm. submitted already, I'd like to remind you of recording the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Meet Company platform. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company. And immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order the company can better understand your views and expectations. John, Steve, obviously you can see those questions that we've had submitted from um, attendees during the presentation today. If I may just ask you to uh, hand back to you and just click on that Q&A tab uh, and start at the top and just read out those questions where appropriate to do so and give your response. That'll be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, will do. Thank you very much. Um, so the first one is quite a specific question, interesting question. Uh, do you see Cakebox as a competitor? And if so, how much of a threat are they to your business model? Well, first I would say um, I think Cakebox is a cracking business. Um, I have followed it over the last few years since it listed. I don't believe it's a competitor, to be honest. I've thought quite hard about it. It tends to be um, quite localised in terms of its locations. It tends to be egg-free and um, it tends to have, I guess, a bit of a a high ethnic um, component in terms of the areas that it, that it bases its shops, the types of products it supplies. Products are quite expensive. Um, they are a lot of fresh cream and they are, you know, very much kind of celebration based. But I don't think they directly compete, nor is there much overlap with the sorts of products we 
we sell for celebration cakes, um, which are significantly cheaper, have a longer life, and tend to be more licensed brand dominated rather than, than simply uh, bespoke for an individual. Steve, is there anything that I've missed that you would say in addition to that? Uh, no, I completely agree with that. Okay, so I move to the next one then. Um, what is your strategy around m and as you have a strong position with the UK majors? And are, seeing many opportunity, or are you seeing many opportunities? And would you look at further overseas markets? Um, I think firstly, yes. Um, if you looked at our track record over the last few years, we've tended to acquire in order to improve our product portfolio mix, to move into new channels and customers such as food service, both via acquisition of Fletcher's, we moved into bread food service. With the Johnson's acquisition, we moved into cake food service with the likes of Costa. And our most recent acquisition, Ultra Farm, acquired free from assets and customers both in the UK and in Poland. So I think diversification is a theme. Um, it is speciality bakery. The UK is lower risk and easier for us because we have such a strong base here already. Um, but we would certainly look at the European market if we felt that it ticked the right boxes and there was a strong management team that would continue to give continuity to the business and have the knowledge required in the local markets, which can be quite diverse across Europe. Again, Steve, anything um, in addition? No, I, again, you know, that, that, that's absolutely the, the, the board strategy. We are very much specialists in the, in the UK, but we're seeing our overseas business grow. Uh, so when we do go, if we do look at overseas businesses, we need to make sure that we have a proper management team in there that understands that market and we can we can work with to leverage, uh, as we have with our French business products that we have uh, here in the UK and in our Polish business. So there is a, a group strategy where we can uh, build on the back of the product ranges that we've got and that clearly are working here. Um, but we need to make sure that when we do invest in, in, a, in, a, in a business, it adds to that in the UK or overseas, we can, we can work with what we've got for the rest of the group already. Super, thanks, Steve. And the next one, in the announcement yesterday, an outlook section, you referred to headwinds relating to cost increases, so labour shortages and driver shortages. Can you guide more on how this is impacting the business and what, state, and what steps you are taking to address? So yeah, I, this has been something that's been very high profile. Um, I think indeed some of our customers have referred to it recently. If I look to, for example, the Morrison's um, results just recently, and indeed some of our larger um, sort of competitors and, and food businesses. So in the summer, we did see um, you know, driver shortages in particular, we made some changes in terms of the frequency of deliveries where we could, particularly to the out of home sector where we were um, you know, doing smaller drops more frequently. We're now doing larger drops less frequently. Um, in terms of, um, sort of you know, skilled workers shortages, uh, we noticed during the summer that there was a shortage of agency labour in certain locations around the UK. Um, we have to be competitive for skills and labour um, in each of the areas that we operate in. So where we have had to, when we have increased wage rates, particularly at the entry level, in order to be able to make sure we can compete for the people that we need. And you know, cost increases on commodities. We have some trackers which we simply pass through things like flower prices to some of our larger customers. So we work openly and collaboratively on that. But with the other cost increases and with our smaller customers, then we would typically look to either improve our efficiencies internally. And if that's not sufficient, which in this instance it won't be because of the level of inflation that we're now seeing in the economy, we will pass that through. We would typically do that with a 12 week notice period for our customers so that they can adjust um, their ranges and, and their promotional programs with us in, in good, or good order. And Steve, anything additional you'd want to raise? No, the only, the only assurance that you know, in food, we, we are very, we've got uh, the ability because of uh, the way we operate and our relationship with customers, there is always uh, a, a need to recover these prices from retailers if that's the, if we've got inflation and we have a track record of doing so. Um, they never like it, but these in, these issues that we're facing that you've, you've written there, the labour shortages and the, and the impact that it's having on inflation is a cross industry dynamic. And therefore, it is something where, you know, we feel quite comfortable of operating again in this in this very tough environment and recovering those costs. Yeah, I mean, as we've learned for the last 18 months, um, 
you know, our customers' key requirements really are to have suppliers that are big enough and adaptable enough to be able to service them, you know, with the peaks and troughs of things like COVID and with the challenges of things like Brexit. So, uh, you know, I think there's a there's a professionalism there that recognises that strong retailers need strong partners and strong manufacturers. And that's exactly the relationship that we have with our major customers. Next question then is, can you give an indication um, with your new facility, um, how much extra capacity the business has to grow without major capex? And Steve, that might be one that you want to lead on. Yeah, I mean, we, we've got a, a very a variety of different products that are made in different sites on different uh, type of machines. The, the, an, the answer really is that it quite often when it comes to needing to uh, increase outputs, we just change the shift patterns and put more shift patterns on without the need to invest in, uh, in capital. But as I, as I said, it, there are areas where we believe that we've got a niche and a strength where we do invest in that capacity, which is what we, which I referred to on the dough balls and on the and on the artisan bread. And indeed, in in the current year, we are investing in, a, in additional buns and rolls capacity. We are very big in buns and rolls. We supply Kentucky Fried Chicken, but we also supply a lot of the major retailers. And we are finding that we're getting a lot of demand from uh, customers that we haven't been able to meet in the last couple of years. And therefore, we're putting in a new buns and rolls line. It is in, it is in conjunction with our major customer. So it's actually pretty, uh, pretty low risk when it comes to what will go down that line. It will be filled pretty quickly. So that, that will be a, a scenario where we have extra capacity. But you know, over the course of the years, we have invested continuously in our business and you know, the, the lines in, are, are appropriate for our needs and, uh, and have the flexibility to increase if we need so as, it's, as they currently stand. Yeah, I'd reiterate that. We are very well invested for a good few years there. We were spending sort of you know, 10, 12 million pounds a year well ahead of depreciation. Uh, so we've got a well-invested business and we're optimizing it now. Our next question then, um, specific one, um, are you having problems with Brexit paperwork? Um, if you ask my supply chain teams back in January and February, they would have said yes. <laughs> um, but those were very much teething problems as I think both sides um, of the equation were trying to figure out what the new regulations were. People were being trained up quite quickly. It is like uh, the Irish border and also um, the English and French border. Uh, we were seeing people, you know, getting used to the new regulations, um, understanding what was and was not required, etc. We've continued to supply our customers throughout. Um, our European growth wouldn't have been possible in the second half unless we've been able to continue to get our products out into Europe, which we have done really well. So I think we've had the right advisors, we've had the right support, we've had the right focus on it. So, you know, touch wood, we so far have been able to continue to operate um, with a little bit of disruption, a little bit of extra cost, um, but without any serious um, implications. And the next question is also quite a specific question. So do you have an online presence or are you totally relying on the retailers for distribution and sales? Um, so yes, yeah, some um, you know kind of brandy business, typically in food and drink, would have an online channel where they're selling direct. Um, that's not really uh, Finsbury's uh, you know, role or, or route to market. So we work with big international brands um, when we work with all, all sorts of retailers across all channels. So um, we have a, a small business in France which does a little bit of online um, sort of celebration cakes, uh, more as a kind of trial um, across Europe, um, but in the UK which is the bulk of our business, and we operate through, uh, purely through our growth partners um, and the retailers, depending on which channel, channel it is. Guys, thank you very much. I think you've pretty much covered off everything we've had through, and I am just conscious of, of time as well. So any further questions that do come through, of course, you will be able to review and we'll, we can put responses where, where appropriate to do so. Um, on that basis, John, perhaps I could just ask you just for a uh, final summary before we uh, redirect the attendees to give you some feedback. Certainly, thanks very much. So why Finsbury, I guess, is the obvious question that you're asking. I think we've described ourselves as very resilient, very diversified, with great products and brand partners, which we're very well invested, we've got a very low level of debt, we're very, very cash generative, and we've got a well-covered dividend. We've got strong history of organic and acquisition growth over a long period of time, and frankly, we're undervalued versus our peers. Thank you very much for your time.
That's absolutely fantastic. John, Steve, thank you for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Finsbury Foods Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you.